video is another mess and defies much of crochet logic and rules. Watch at your own risk, viewer discretion is advised. Okay, but hear me out. As you know already, this sweater is inspired by the Irish brand Hope Macaulay, and I am in no means trying to take credit or plagiarize. I simply loved and was really inspired by her design, so I thought I would take on this challenge and have my broke ass recreate their trendy, chunky $300 sweaters while adding my own touch to it, with absolutely no pattern or guidance whatsoever. Which is why my level of quality is nowhere close to theirs. And though I could have taken the time to find a basic sweater pattern as a guide, my brain didn't comprehend that as a possibility until after finishing this. So this is me basically winging the entire thing based off of my previous crochet experience. But lucky for you, I wasn't going to hide away my mistakes, so I'll be pointing out what mistakes I made along the way and what I could have done better instead. So if I haven't scared you away already, let's dive in. Let's start with materials, shall we? The yarn I chose to use was this super bulky size 6 yarn by the brand Loops and Thread, known as Lush Alpaca. It's a mix of acrylic and yes, actual alpaca wool, and it's super soft and not rough and itchy whatsoever. This here is the light green color, but I also used the lavender, yellow, and pink colors to go along with Hope Macaulay's color palette. I then used a thick and 15 10 millimeter crochet hook and kept a darning needle handy as well and the sweater design i was going for also had three large sparkly buttons and i was lucky enough to find some ironically similar ones from joann's and last but not least i had a pair of scissors and measuring tape as well now the sweater i was trying to create was inspired by these three stunning funky chunky sweaters and you might be wondering as depicted by the yarn why i'm not making the super chunky sweater of theirs well, I'm sorry that my Michaels and Joann's is always sold out of chunky yarn and that they never know when they'll ever get a new shipment. So I improvised and chose the next chunkiest thing. But I will tackle these super chunky sweaters someday. And if y'all would like a video of that too, give this video a like and comment because since the yarn gods won't listen to my cries, they might listen to your guys's and thus pity me and potentially grab me the chunky yarn of my dreams. So when that does come true, I hope Macaulay sweater part two will be coming to a screen near you. Now, before moving on to the body of the sweater, I have to explain how I approached, or well, lack of approach at the time, and sized this sweater. The main body consists of three parts, the back panel and the two front panels. I knew for me personally that I wanted the width of the sweater to be about 26 inches wide and 21 inches long, or well, around that basically. The back panel was created to be 26 inches, but the front side was just a tad bit more complicated. I could have just split the front panels to be 13 inches each, but I had to take into account of the button band. I wanted the button band to be about 2 inches in the middle, so that meant I had to make each panel about 12 inches instead so that it all matched up with the back side. As for the length, I made sure all the panels had the same number of rows, but I also made sure that I left enough space for the bottom ribbing, which I also wanted for to be 2 inches. So whatever number of rows I did had to measure up to 19 inches or so. Now, did I think about all this before making these panels? Well, let's just say I have a knack for figuring things out after I screw them up. Anyways, moving on, to begin this chunky sweater, I started off with the sleeves. The goal was to make these big and puffy, a staple in Hope Macaulay's designs. To begin, I created a slip knot by wrapping the yarn around my two fingers, taking the long strand and putting it over the loop, and then taking my crochet hook, pulling that strand through the loop, and then pulling the knot really tight. And then to adjust, I pulled a long strand. Then it was time to create a chain, and to do that, I wrapped the yarn around my crochet hook, and then went through the loop. Again, wrap the yarn and through the loop. I continued chaining until I had 23 chains. And then to make sure it was shaped like a sleeve, I went into the first chain with my crochet hook. And then I yarned over, pulled through, and went through both loops to create a slip stitch. Now I chained one and inside the next chain, I made a single crochet. So to do that, you go into the chain yarn over come out you have two loops and then yarn over and go through both loops so i basically did all of these single crochets so 23 of them all the way around after making my last single crochet of that row i had this circular looking shape that was about to form into the sleeve to finish that row off i went into the first single crochet i made in that row so into that stitch yarn over came out and then 
did my slip stitch to finish off that row. Now, because I'm a knitter wannabe and because the actual Hope Macaulay sweaters are knitted and not crocheted, the main stitch I use throughout this entire sweater is known as the waistcoat stitch, aka single crochet's cousin. To make the waistcoat stitch, I moved on to the second row by chaining one. And now what you would do if you were just doing single crochets is that you would go through this braid looking thing, which is just the top of single crochet, and then complete a single crochet like that. But to make the waistcoat stitch, we have to do something slightly different. So what you have to do is that you're not going to go through the stitch, you're going to go through the weird looking shape that's in between each of the stitches. So there's a proper term, I don't know what it is, but it's these like braid looking things that are right in between. So when you go in through those, it's kind of pretty tight, but this is only for this row. You go in and then you just complete a single crochet like so. Another tip is that when you're doing the waistcoat stitch, make sure that one of the strands is longer than the other one so that it creates a proper V shape. I continue doing this all the way around to finish this second row. And then when I got to the end, I finished my last waistcoat stitch and then slip stitch into the first waistcoat stitch of that row, like so. And now that was just the difficult part of the waistcoat stitch. From now on, it's going to be pretty easy. So you're going to chain one to move on to the third row. And now you have these pretty loose looking V shapes. And you're going to be going through those to make the waistcoat stitch look nicer. So they're a lot looser, a lot easier to go through compared to that row that we just did. I continued doing rows of the waistcoat stitch until I had about 24 rows of that and that measured about 12 inches long or 30 centimeters long and then 8 inches wide or about 21 centimeters wide. And the reason why I stopped at 24 rows is because this was how much I wanted the majority of this sleeve to be like how long I wanted it to be personally for me. If I wanted it to be longer I could have made more rows, if I wanted it shorter I could have made it less rows and when you flip the sleeve right side out you could literally see the gorgeousness of this waistcoat stitch and it literally looks like i knitted it but i did not moving on making sure i flipped it back to the wrong side it was time to end the sleeve and create the sleeve cuff moving on to the 25th row i chained one and made a normal waistcoat stitch into the next stitch and then I made another normal waistcoat stitch into the next stitch. But then it was time to start decreasing. So what I did was I went into the next stitch and did a waistcoat stitch, but I didn't finish it. I left the two loops, went into the next stitch, yarned over, then I had three loops, and then I yarned over and went through all three loops. So in this way, I was decreasing by making two stitches into one stitch. So the pattern for this row is to make two separate waistcoat stitches and then decrease by putting two stitches together into one. After doing that all around, my last stitch was to decrease like so. And then I went into the first face coat stitch of that row, slip stitch so that I could finish off that row. And then we're gonna move on to the next row and continue doing the decrease process just slightly differently. So I chained one and then I made another normal, just one waistcoat stitch into the next stitch. But then instead of doing another one, I just started decreasing. So I went into the next stitch, did a waistcoat, didn't finish it, went into the next stitch, which happened to be a decreased one, came out after yarning over, and then I had three loops, yarned over, and went through all three. So the pattern for this row, just slightly different from the last one, is that you do one single waistcoat stitch, then you de decrease. One single waistcoat stitch, decrease. One, decrease, one, decrease, all the way around. After coming back around and making a slip stitch, it was time to make the final decreasing row. So I chained one and basically all I did for this row was I just decreased. So it's just decreasing for every single stitch, no single waistcoat stitches at all, just decreasing all the way around. Once I was done with that row, I cut off my yarn and then I chained one, but pulled all the yarn through and pulled tight to fasten that off and create a knot. Now it was time to make the sleeve cuffs. I changed my color to yellow, so I picked up the yellow yarn. And then going into the first 
stitch of the row I made a slip stitch to secure it onto the work and then to begin this first row of the sleeve cuff I chained one and then I made a just one single waistcoat stitch into the next stitch and then another waistcoat stitch but within that same stitch I made another one so now what we're doing is that we're increasing instead of decreasing so in the next stitch I did just one waistcoat stitch so the pattern for this row is to do one single waistcoat stitch in one stitch and then two waistcoat stitches in one stitch so one two one two one two all the way around and then when I was done doing my last waistcoat stitch of that row I slip stitched it to the first waistcoat stitch of the row to finish off that row and then I chained one and from here on out all I did was one single waistcoat stitch in every stitch so no decreasing no increasing at all just continue doing that all the way around and kept on making more rows until I had a total of five rows of this yellow yarn for the sleeve cuff. In the end, the sleeve cuff ended up being four inches wide or about 10 centimeters wide. Once I had one sleeve completed, I just repeated the entire same process one more time for the other sleeve. And because the sleeves are usually never the same color in Hope Macaulay's designs, I switched up the color to lavender for the other sleeve and then set both of those aside. Now the sleeves are probably the only thing I did confidently, whereas these front panels are another story. Beginning with a slip knot, I used pink yarn to start off the right front panel. I then started making chains and ended up with 20 chains. To create the first row of this right front panel, I went into the next chain and made a single crochet. Again, we're going to be continuing the waistcoat stitches. So just in every chain, I just did one single crochet all the way across. Coming to the last chain of the row, I made a single crochet, chained one, and then moved on to the second row. So again, we're going to be going in between those weird spaces of the single crochets, so not the single crochets themselves. So I continue doing that, and again, this part of the waistcoat stitch is the only annoying part, but it only happens for one row because once you have this part figured out, the waistcoat stitch is down the hill from there. Now, Genius Me did not film this correctly at the time, so let's pretend this little square piece is actually the right front panel. Now, moving on to the third row, this is where things start getting a little bit more different compared to doing it in the round like we did in the sleeves. So normally, when doing the waistcoat stitch like in the sleeves, we would go through this normal v looking shape thing like this but if you do that here it would actually create a single crochet but we don't want that we want a waistcoat stitch instead you'll be going through the upside down v which is quite similar to what you did in the second row and essentially you go through the upside down v which is a lot more loose this time i don't know why it's not loose right there but it's a lot more loose and you do that for every single row and both sides of the crochet piece will end up having the waistcoat stitch look at the 14th row, and after creating this rectangular looking piece, which is about half of how long I wanted this front panel to be, at about 8 inches, it was time to start decreasing my stitches to create the v-neck. I fastened off the pink and switched colors to lavender, since color blocking was another Hope Macaulay design aspect I wanted to implement into this sweater. I continued making waistcoat stitches with the lavender color, just like normal. And then once I got to the end of that 15th row, it was time to decrease. So similar to how we did in the sleeves, what I did was I went into one stitch to create the waistcoat stitch, but I didn't finish it. And then I went into the next stitch and then had three loops and yarned over it and went through all three to create two stitches into one. This will start creating the slant for the v-neck. So to move on to the next row, I chained one, flipped my work over, and for this, I just did one waistcoat stitch in each stitch all the way across. So basically how the decreasing works for this front panel is that it's one row, you decrease at the end, and then for the next row, there's no decreasing whatsoever. So decrease, no decrease, decrease, no decrease. I knew I had to decrease when I was heading towards the slant, and then I knew I didn't have to decrease when I was heading away from the slant. This brings me to mistake number one. Over here, I just repeated the same process of alternating the decreasing rows 
tilled the top of what ended up being 34 rows total, or about 19 inches. Because of this, it created a pretty wide v-neck when initially I was trying to go for a narrow v-neck. So what I should have done was to stop decreasing about halfway through of this top portion of the panel, or the lavender color portion of the panel, so around the 24th row, around here. And then from there, I would just crochet all the way through for each row with no decreasing at all for any row until I reached the length I wanted. And of course, I didn't do that because at the time, I thought it was fine. So after finishing my last 34th row and fastening that off, I then also crocheted another panel for the right side. I essentially did the exact same thing, but I just flipped it around so that it looked like it was for the left side. I changed the color to yellow and chose not to do color blocking for this one. And ding, 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 we have reached mistake number two. As depicted, the two panels aren't exactly the same size with the pink and purple panel being 13 inches wide, and the other one was clearly wider. This was simply because I didn't carefully figure things out like in the sizing plan, and I forgot about the button band too. So, of course, that was something I had to fix, and we'll get to that later. Moving on to the back side, which was pretty easy, thankfully. All I did was chain 42 chains, which measured about 26 inches, as mentioned before. I continued the waistcoat stitch, and I also first started with pink yarn, and continued doing the waistcoat stitch with that color till the 14th row, just like the right front panel. After that, I also changed colors to lavender again, and then continued the waistcoat stitch till I reached the 34th row, measuring the 19 inches I needed. The last piece to create was the bottom ribbing. Back with the light green yarn, I chained 5, and then to move on to the first row, I made slip stitches. So into the chain, yarn over, and then slip through both loops. And then moving on to the second row, I chained 1, but now it was time to create the secret ribbing effect. Now when we usually crochet, we go through this braid looking thing known as a stitch. But a stitch is made up of a back loop and a front loop. So to create the ribbing effect, I went through the back loop and continue making slip stitches in the back loop all the way across and for every single row. I continued doing that till I had 84 rows. And why 84 rows, you might ask? Well, this brings us to mistake number three, sorta. This isn't necessarily a mistake, but more of a, here's something easier I could have done compared to the unnecessary struggle I put myself through. If I had chosen the easier and more basic route, I would have continued making more rows till it was 52 inches long, which is double the width because the ribbing has to come around both the back and front sides of the sweater. But I wanted to create something smaller than 52 inches because I, for some reason, wanted to create this cinched look for the sweater. And that's fine and all, but I'll show you why I made it more difficult for myself later. <laughs> With all the pieces created, the back side, the right and front left panels, the sleeves, and lastly the ribbing, it was time to sew the pieces together. Over here is a diagram of where I had to sew along this sweater, which are the sides, but not all the way, the top, the sleeves, and the ribbing at the bottom. And while we're at it, let's revisit mistake number two. Because the front panels were clearly bigger than they should have been, I had to make sure that I was sewing about 1-2 to two inches of it into the inside so that I could make it smaller as I stitched everything together. To make sure I didn't crochet the sides too much so that I had room for the sleeve holes, I placed a safety pin as a guide for me to know when to stop sewing the sides together, like so. One way to sew this was to use a crochet hook and the slip stitches I used to make the ribbing. But this led to mistake number 4. At first, I slip stitched the sides and the top and then found out it was a bad idea because it was too loose to hold this heavy yarn together, so it actually stretched out the yarn and created these huge holes. So to fix this mistake, I took out those slip stitches and used a darning needle instead. It ended up sewing everything tighter and was much better. After sewing along the sides and the top, I had to sew on the sleeves. To do this, I flipped the sleeve right side out and making sure the body of the sweater was inside out, I tucked it inside the sweater like so, and I actually used the crochet hook and slip stitches to sew around the sleeve hole created. It didn't stretch out the yarn in any way, and I found the slip stitches worked well just for the sleeves. 
And as you could see, I'm kind of sewing about an inch lower than the yellow panel. And this is so that to fix mistake number two, I could tuck in a part of this into the inside of the sweater to make it smaller. The last thing to sew was the ribbing, making us revisit mistake number three. I used slip stitches to sew this as well because there was no way to do this with a darning needle. To create that cinched look that I was trying to go for, I had to slip stitch in each stitch at some parts, but then decrease at other parts. Throughout majority of this ribbing, I did 5 slip stitches and then I decreased by slip stitching 3 stitches together instead of 2 like I did for the front panels. In the end, this was just such an utter pain to go through and there was also more to how complicated this part actually became, but it was all completely so unnecessary, which is why by the time I was done with it, I knew I should have just used the easier route with the ribbing by adding more rows. But do we ever listen to ourselves? No, no, we don't, sadly. The button band. Let me tell you, we finally made it through the roller coaster ride of emotions you get from an on and off relationship, and in this case, it was me and the sweater. This button band also happened to be the neck band of the sweater, and at the same time, I think it helped by making the v-neck more narrow too. I began slip stitches on the right side of the sweater like so. And then I went all the way around to the left side, finishing my first row. I then chained one and slip stitched back around, creating my second row, and back again for my third row. To start my fourth row, I had to change things up a bit because I had to make, you guessed it, the buttonholes. I decided to make my buttonholes on the left side of the sweater. Starting at the bottom corner, I made one single crochet for that row, then I chained one, skipped two stitches, and slip stitched into the third stitch from my crochet hook. Then I continued making slip stitches till my next buttonhole, for which I repeated the same process. And then I did that just one more time so that I had a total of three buttonholes, one at the bottom corner, one halfway through, and one right before the v-neck slant began. When I was done making the buttonholes, I then slip stitched back around to the other side to finish that fourth row. For the fifth row, I slip stitched back around to the buttonholes, and inside these gaps I made for these buttonholes, I made two slip stitches inside of them, like so. And in that way, I finished off the buttonhole. And finally, for the last sixth row, I just made normal slip stitches in each stitch, all the way around, and fastened it off. The last thing to add to this button band was, of course, the buttons. I used a darning needle to sew them onto the right side, making sure they were in line with the buttonholes. And before I could finally declare myself free from this torturous relationship with the sweater, I had to hide away the sticking out pieces of yarn. I used a crochet hook to slip them through the stitches and then scissors to cut off the excess. But I mostly just cut them off. I mean, nobody's gonna know. And no, they're not gonna know. Because how would they know? After talking things out and having a heart-to-heart, -heart, my $300 Hope Macaulay dupe of a sweater and I were back together. And I liked it a lot. To style this, I wanted this sweater to stand out even more than it already did. So I paired it here with a white mock neck sweater, since it was 30 degrees out, but I think any white top would look great. I also paired it with some white wide leg jeans from YesStyle and white sneakers with gold accented jewelry to top it off. And if you made it this far and survived the mess of mistakes I made with this crazy project, thank you, really. I hope it helped and gave you an idea of how much of a mess I really am because it doesn't get any better. But thank you so much for watching. Toodles.